communion is the heart of our worship. And even as we worship online, all in our own places, we will be celebrating communion together each Sunday. So use whatever supplies you have and be ready for that important part of our worship service. Have you heard about getting to know your church? The questions that you can answer on video so we can all deepen our relationships even though we're socially distanced? Look for the article in the Midweek Reminder, pick three questions, video yourself, and upload it to the link provided. Lots of people have been asking, isn't there something we can do to help with the situation that our country and our world is facing? It's not just the disease that people are dealing with, it's the economic fallout as well. So our outreach team has decided that we're gonna have something called pandemic relief. If you would like to donate, all the money will be divided in half. Half of it'll go to God's Pantry, a food pantry here in our area, and half of it'll go to the Assistance Center of Collin County. All the money will be used for, to help people with food, with job placement, transportation, and relief from their bills that they may not be able to pay during this time. So I'm wondering, how many of us received stimulus money from the government and realized we may not need it? However you would like to give, we're gonna have our offering going through May 31st, and then all the money will be divided and dispersed. So if you'd like to share in this pandemic relief, make sure whether you give online or through a check that you write pandemic, pandemic in the memo line, then we'll know how to use this money. This year, we are doing Rocky Railway Vacation Bible School at Home Edition. It will be July 13th through July 17th. It will go live on our YouTube at 2 p.m. and on our Facebook at 6 p.m. Go to our website to get registered. One of the things we've been taking advantage of in this time of online is to learn new things. Lots of us are learning new things about how we can be the church. One thing we want to encourage, if it makes sense for you, is to try our online giving. You can go to our church webpage, go to the giving section, and it'll take you from there. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for worship here at First Christian Church of Plano. Michelle is feeling a little ill today, but don't worry, it's just a little bug, so she will not be here today. So join me in keeping her in our prayers. Please stand and join me for today's call to worship. We are called to bear good fruit. May the fruit of our lives reflect the gospel of Christ. Let us store good in our hearts. May we call up that good and not be evil every day. Let us worship the one who makes all good. When our confidence is shaken, in beliefs we thought secure, when the Spirit in its sickness seeks but cannot find a cure, God is active in the tensions of a faith not yet mature. In the discipline of praying, when it's hardest to believe, in the drudgery of caring, when it's not enough to grieve, Faith maturing learns acceptance of the insights we receive. Please join us in prayer. Heavenly Father, I hope that in this time we can stay healthy and also remind us to keep praying. Please allow all those who attend this today to have good times as we are quarantined. Let those who have the virus to be healed by you. Please prepare our hearts for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Today, for our children's moments, I wanted to get all of you excited for this summer's VBS, which will be taking place July 13th through 17th. I don't know if you know this, but we are doing it online this year, and it is going to be so much fun. We're going to get so many pictures from all of you, and we are just going to share this time together while still being safe. So let's get up and learn the moves to today, our theme song for this year's VBS, Your Power Will Pull Us Through. Trust in you, Jesus, you're all, you're all, you're all that we need. Your power will pull us through. We're trusting in you, we're trusting in you. To lead us, we're on the right track. Oh, 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 oh. Wide open spaces for wide open eyes. We're looking ahead for the next big surprise. Oh, 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 oh. We trust, we trust, we trust in you, Jesus. You're all, you're all. Spaces for wide open eyes. We're looking ahead for the next big surprise. Oh, 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 oh. We trust, we trust, we trust in you, Jesus. You're all, you're all that we need. Your power will pull us through. We're trusting in you, we're trusting in you. You give us hope. So this is the time where we get to stand up, stomp our feet, clap our hands, and praise the one true God. Ooh, ooh, I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the winds, they try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. I can feel the waters rise. I 
can hear the howling lies that haunt me. Fear won't hold me now. My feet are on the rock. When I feel my hope about to break, I will cling to your unchanging grace. see the morning light I can feel the joy on the horizon here my faith is found I stand on solid So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. When I feel my heart. not living in ordinary times, that is for sure. But despite the inconveniences, the hardships, the sad times, the hard times, one thing we can be sure of continuing is God's own generosity. When we consider the oceans, the mountains, the birds in the air, and the fish in the sea, we are reminded that God continues to grace us with gifts daily. Jesus can pull our attention away from the worries about scarcity and turn our gaze toward the beautiful gifts of God's creation. We can bring our gifts of time and talent and money and lay them at the feet of Jesus with the assurance of God's continuing care for us. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, on this spring morning, we come together to offer our gifts so that the ministry of this church will continue to grow and be a blessing to this community and to the world. We offer these gifts to you, God, in gratitude and praise for the wonders of our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. We have several in our congregation right now who are struggling with illness. Fortunately, we have one member who's contracted and recovered from the coronavirus, and we're thankful for answered prayers. Michelle is homesick today. We have others who are sick, some who you may know about and some who you may not. Some like to keep those things to themselves, but nobody wants to keep it from God. One of the most basic things that we find about our faith is praying for those who are sick. And right now there are literally millions all over the world who are suffering with sickness. Not just this virus that's taken the world hostage, but all kinds of other diseases and issues. And why do we continue to pray for these things? Because it works. Because God is a healer. God has created our lives and sustains us and can make us whole and strong. And so today as we go into our time of prayer, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for all of our needs. We give God thanks 
in this time of prayer, I'll open us and then I'll leave a moment for you to pray in your own families, on your own, for the things that you need. And then we'll close together with the Lord's Prayer. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Lord, we thank you today for the opportunity we have, as always, to come before you with our needs. We know that you understand our needs and know about needs that we aren't even aware of. And yet you still call us to come before you, to tell you what we need, to tell you how we're suffering in the ways that we need your sustaining. So today we bring you those needs. We pray for those who are suffering with illness. And we ask that you would chase those things from their system. That you would make them strong and whole and let their bodies function as you designed them to function. For those recovering from surgery, for those dealing with unknown illness, we ask that you give wisdom to doctors and nurses. Help them read the tests and know what to prescribe. But more than all these things, Lord, we ask for the healing power of your spirit, not just for bodies, but for hearts and minds as well. And now we bring to you the needs that are on our hearts. And now we pray together as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 43 to 45. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. A friend of mine who's also a minister had an idea once for a sermon series that he and I could do together. It would be called, The Bible Doesn't Say That. We would try to take some ideas from popular theology that are very commonly believed and challenge them if they weren't actually in the Bible. The most common example are things like God helps those who help themselves or everything happens for a reason or God won't give you more than you can handle, stuff like that. And for a lot of popular theology, not only are these phrases not found in Scripture, sometimes they're actually the opposite of what the Bible really does say. So today, in the Gospel of Luke, as we come to the end of the Sermon on the Plain, we will hear Jesus refute a very widespread belief in popular Christian theology. In this case, it's not easily expressed in a cliché, it's more deep-seated than that. The idea is this. Salvation is not really about what you do. 
It's about what you believe. Or we might think of it this way. Faith is not about behavior. It's about what you feel. How much you love God. Now people don't usually say these things explicitly. But if you listen to people talk about faith, these ideas come up again and again. But today, as Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Plain, I think we'll find that these ideas are actually wrong. When Jesus talks about the true test of faith, as He will today, it isn't about feelings or beliefs. It's about actions. So let's take a look and see what we find. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. Now, people do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. What would you think if you asked an apple-growing neighbor of yours, which is the best tree in your whole orchard? And she said, oh, it has to be this one. This is my favorite tree. So you say, wow, so it has the best apples? What if she said, actually, no, the apples are terrible. You can't even eat them. They're basically rotten every time. Just awful. Terrible. Wouldn't you be a little confused? You might say, oh, okay, so I guess the tree gives really good shade, you know, when you sit under it to read a book or something. No, not really. It doesn't actually have any leaves, so there's no shade. Um, okay, so maybe it has like especially good wood or something, like you could make something from it. Oh, no, it's almost completely rotten. It just falls apart if you try to touch it. So why do you say that it's the best tree in the orchard? Oh, I don't know. I think it just has a really good heart. I don't know about you, but I don't think that person is going to do very well in the apple business. Like Jesus said, every tree is recognized by its own fruit. If it's a good tree, it just will produce good fruit. That's what makes it a good tree. In the same way, if the fruit is bad, the tree is bad. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. So, what does this mean when it comes to people and faith? If we are the trees, what is the fruit? What is it that our lives produce? Actions, outcomes, results. Jesus is saying that we can evaluate the condition of our hearts by our actions. Jesus continues in verse 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What comes out of us is a sign of what is inside us. We can't give what we don't have. And what we do give is evidence of what we do have, of who we are. By the way, Jesus refutes another popular idea here. Did you notice? We usually think that it doesn't matter what you say, it only matters what you do. According to Jesus, that's not true. He says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In Matthew, when Jesus is talking about the fruit of our lives, he adds this. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. The book of James puts it this way. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? The clear answer is no. So if we think that we can say destructive things, dehumanizing things, mocking things, racist things, sexist things, if we think we can talk that way as long as we don't act that way, Jesus disagrees. For him, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Speaking is an action. It's a fruit. The only question is, is it a good fruit 
or a bad fruit. Jesus wants us to bring forth good things. Another way I think sometimes we try to let ourselves off the hook is to think, well, at least I don't do too many bad things. I don't run around on my spouse. I don't steal. I don't hurt anyone. I'm not adding too much really to the badness of the world. So that's got to be pretty good. Makes me think of a story I heard once from a friend of mine. He told me that when he was in high school, he was about 30 years older than me, but he told me when he was in high school, he decided to enter a corn growing contest. And when he first told me, I had to get him to repeat it. A what? A corn growing contest. I guess he was in FFA or 4-H or something like that. And I remember telling him, you and I grew up in really different times and places if you were in a corn growing contest. But anyway, he decided to enter this corn growing contest with his other high school kids. And you had so many weeks to grow as much corn as you could on a certain size plot. And he didn't know that much about it, but he got his dad to help him. And so I called his, he's since passed away, but I called his wife this week to ask, get the details of this story right. And she said technically his dad did most of the work. But his contribution was a special fertilizer. He had read about it in some magazine and he decided that he would triple the amount so that he could jumpstart his little corn crop. And apparently it worked great. His corn grew twice as fast as anyone else's. It grew taller and thicker and fuller and he just knew he was going to win. But the only problem was when they got to the end of the contest, there was no corn. The fertilizer made the, stro- the stalks grow really fast, but somehow they also made it to where it produced no ears. So guess what? He didn't win the contest. Which is worse if you're in a corn growing contest, having bad fruit or having no fruit? In that case, does it really make a difference? The point of the contest was to see who could produce the most good corn. So whether you had bad corn or no corn, you lose. That's what Jesus seems to be saying about our lives. He wants us to produce good things that come from the good stored up in our heart. So just minding our own business, just not bothering anybody, that's not going to be good enough. He wants our lives to produce outcomes in keeping with God's love, with God's goodness. So how do we do that? What is the fruit that Jesus wants? In the next verse, he tells us pretty bluntly. This might be the most challenging verse in all of Scripture. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What is the fruit that Jesus wants? Obedience. He wants us to do what he says. Like what? Like all the stuff he's just been talking about. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Turn the other cheek. Give to everyone who asks you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Lend without expecting to get anything back. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge, do not condemn, forgive. That's what Jesus tells us. That's the obedience that he wants. And those are just the things that he tells us in this one chapter. In the rest of this book and in the other Gospels, he tells us a whole lot more than that. Following Jesus means doing what he says. Here in verse 46 and in the next verse, Jesus lays out the basic definition of what faith really is. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. Jesus outlines four things that manifest the life of faith. Calling him Lord, coming to him, hearing his words, and putting them into practice. For Jesus That is faith. That is following Him. That's what He wants. Notice, by the way, what is not on that list. 
and not found anywhere else in the teaching of Jesus. He doesn't say, if you're going to follow me, this is what faith really is. I'll show you what it's like. It's having strong emotional feelings. I want you to really feel it with a passion inside. I've actually talked to people who worry that they might not really be a Christian because they don't have the same level of powerful emotions that they seem to see in other people. They don't weep with tears when they sing a song. They don't raise their hands and shout with joy and jump up and down. Those feelings just aren't in them and so they wonder, do I really love Jesus? Am I really his follower? But he didn't say, if you love me, shout really loud, cry really hard. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If I have a super passionate, jumping up and down type of love inside my bones, but I don't do what he said, it's not going to mean anything. If I try with my whole heart for my whole life to love him and follow him, but I just don't often or ever have those strong feelings, that ain't going to matter either. What he wants is obedience. You know what else he doesn't say is a part of faith? This is another thing that we often try to inject ourselves. He doesn't say, if you love me, I really want you to feel guilty most of the time about all the ways you have messed up. I want you to be sad, I want you to feel shame, and I want you to just see yourself as a terrible creature because that's really what loving me means. That is not found in Scripture. I'm not saying we shouldn't care about our sin. Of course we should. It's such a big deal that Jesus died for it, but he doesn't want us to focus on it. He doesn't want us to be knee-deep in it all the time. He wants us to focus instead on obeying him today. We probably disobeyed him yesterday. Let's focus on obeying him today. Another thing he doesn't seem to add, nor does the New Testament, is if you love me, I want you to be really showy about it. I want you to loudly tell other people all the time how much of a Christian you are. You need to wear t-shirts. You need to blare your music. You need to make sure that there are signs in public that everybody sees and blah, 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 blah. He doesn't say that. In fact, sometimes he speaks against that. Don't pray on the street corners to be seen by others. When you give to others, don't announce it with trumpets. What Jesus wants is a changed life. He wants us to do the things he tells us to do. That's what will determine whether or not we're following him. And following him is the only thing that will save us in the end. So he gives us a picture of what that looks like as he closes this section. When we acknowledge him as Lord and come to him and hear his words and put them into practice, he says this is what that will be like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. What's the only difference between the two builders in this parable? Their foundation. The first builder laid the foundation on rock. He dug down past what was on the surface until he came to solid rock. And that's where he grounded his house. Apparently most of the soil in Palestine is what's called hard pan. A crusty layer that seems very solid. And most of the time, it is pretty solid. In fact, the farmers, I'm sure, from FFH and Future Farmers of America and all that stuff would tell you that it's really hard to work with. It's hard to get your plow through it and all those kinds of things. But at first glance, you would think then, because it's so crusty, that it would make a good foundation. But when a flood comes, it won't hold a building in place. The house will shift and slide with the water and collapse. So an experienced builder will dig past that surface hard pan, as difficult as that is, until they get to the solid, true bedrock underneath. That won't shift no matter how big the flood is. So if your house is grounded on that rock, it's not going anywhere. So what does this whole analogy symbolize? The first builder who dug down to the rock, Jesus says that, that is like the person who hears my words and puts them into practice. Not just hears my words and believes them, not just hears my words and celebrates them, hears my words and memorizes them. Hears his words 
and puts them into practice. Jesus seems to be referring to a famous passage from Isaiah that foretold the coming of the Messiah. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. Jesus is the tested stone, the precious cornerstone, the sure foundation. But here's the most important part. How do we build on this stone? How do we ground ourselves in him? By doing what he said. Not just by hearing his words, but by putting them into practice. The people compared in this analogy had everything in common except one thing. They all came to Jesus. They all heard what he said. They all built their lives piece by piece, day by day. And they all experienced a flood, a torrent that threatened to destroy them. That's the same for everybody. The only thing separating them is that some of them obeyed Jesus and some didn't. And that's what made the difference. So this idea that we started with, that salvation is not really about what you do, it's just about what you believe. That faith is not about behavior, it's about what you feel, about how much you love God on the inside. Jesus is clearly telling us that's not true. What he wants is obedience. Actions that put his commands into practice. But here's the thing. On our own, we're never going to be able to do that. We're not going to be able to obey him, to love our enemies and turn the other cheek and show mercy and all that stuff. Why? Because on our own, we're not good trees. I don't mean that in a judgmental way. I'm a bad tree too. How do I know? Because I've been studying my own actions for 48 years and there's a whole lot of bad fruit. So what's the answer? Is there any hope? Yes. But we need to make sure we know where our hope lies. What we need is not just to pick up a few new habits or drop a few bad habits. What we need is to become a whole new creation. What did he say? No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its fruit. What we need is for Jesus to remake us into good trees. It's not just about changing what we do. It's about Jesus changing what we are. That's what the entire life of faith is about. Letting Jesus change what we are. When we come to church, that's what we're working on. When we pray, that should be the heart of what we're praying about. When we serve, that's what we're working toward. When we give, when we sacrifice, when we study the Bible, when we fellowship with other believers, when we go to the table, every part of faith is about one thing. Letting Jesus remake what we are. How long will it take? The rest of our lives. That's why we have to be working on it all the time. And as the change happens, how will we know that we're making progress? Good fruit. You want a bonus from today's study? Here's a little exercise for you. Get on your computer, get a good Bible app on your phone or something like that, and do a word search of the New Testament for the word fruit. Pretty much any example you land on will inspire you with what Jesus is making out of your life, with what Jesus is taking from your life and what Jesus is putting in your life. It may seem challenging, when you read those things about the good fruit that Jesus wants, it may even seem impossible. But rising from the dead is pretty impossible, and he did that. That's what Jesus will do for everyone who follows him, who hears his words and tries to put them into practice. And I'll make you this promise. In this church, you will hear his words. We are committed to constantly keeping the life and teaching and love of Jesus before us at all times. In Sunday school, in worship, in Bible studies, at his table, we will always be acknowledging Jesus as Lord, coming to him and hearing his words. But that last part, that crucial step of putting his words into practice, that's up to each one of us. 
He will help us. He will accomplish it in us, but we have to give our lives to Him and let Him every day. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your table, as we come before you in worship, each time we pray, each time we praise, let it be about one thing, allowing you to remake our lives, to uproot what doesn't belong, and to plant what does. We ask you to make us whole, whatever that means. We ask you to help us become obedient, whatever that turns out to mean. Once again, we give you our whole selves because we trust you to give us eternal life. We ask it in your name. Amen. Let's go together to the Lord's table. Here our children find a welcome in the shepherd's flock and fold. Here as bread and wine are taken, Christ sustains us as of old. Here the servants of the servant seek in worship to explore what it means in daily living to believe and to adore. I had an experience this morning that I've often had when I come to church if I'm the first one to arrive, which I happen to be today or at least in the part of the church that I was in. I went to the office and unlocked the door and went inside. And we have an alarm system. We have different alarm systems in different parts of the church. And there's a little code that you enter in, and then you hit off. So when you come in, the, red, the light is red, and then you enter the code and hit off, and it turns to green. It beeps and turns to green. You know that the alarm is off. But there's about a half second after you hit that off button, and then it turns to green. And in that half second, every single time, even though I've done it many, many times, I'm always worried, I'm always afraid, did I enter it wrong? And now the authorities are about to descend in their wrath and take me to jail. I don't know. It just seems, <clears throat> in that little second, I wonder, did I do it wrong? Every single time. Sometimes when we start to really understand the message of Jesus when we see that it's not just about believing something in our hearts or walking down an aisle one time or praying some prayer, that salvation is much deeper than that, that it really involves our actions, doing what Jesus said. Sometimes when we really start to understand that and hear him say that, we're struck with fear because we know in that moment that's not who we are. We don't do any of those things, not with consistency. And a lot of times to tell the truth, we don't even want to. We don't even wish it were so. So when we hear him talk about those builders, we worry that we don't have the right foundation, that it's all on us and it's never going to happen. But I hope we remember after that, and I hope it takes less than half a second, this salvation has never been up to us. If it was something we could do ourselves, surely we would have already done it, and there's no way Jesus would have had to die on the cross. No, Jesus is going to have to do it for us. He's the one who's going to make this tree good, who's going to make us new. He's just telling us what that will mean. As I save you, it means you're going to love your enemies. As I save you, it means you're going to stop judging and start showing mercy. As I save you, you're going to turn the other cheek even to those who attack you. That's what salvation is. So put your focus on that. Put your energy into that. Because that's where I'm taking you. As we come to this table, we're reminded as we have been many, many times, it's not about what we can do. It's about what he has done, what he is doing, and what he promises to do on the last day. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after blessing God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And the same way after supper, 
he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he invited his disciples, as he invites us today, to come to his table and to do so in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to your table again today, remind us what road we're walking on. That it will mean letting go of all of our natural tendencies, all of the habits we've learned over the course of our lives, and letting you remake us. Replace our self-focus with a focus on you and a focus on others. That you'll teach us truly to do to others as we would have done to us. To love our neighbor, to see and know and love our neighbor even as we love ourselves. Even as you love all of us. Show us this road and give us the grace and the strength to continue carrying the cross to the end. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go from this place, we commit again to continue the process of the life of faith. One of my favorite verses is from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, where Paul writes and tells followers of Jesus, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That goes against a lot of the things that we've been taught. Con continue to work out yourself. Like, I thought salvation is something that happened in the past. But Paul says continue to work on it right now. I thought salvation is something that only Jesus can do. And yet he tells us to work on it. He says continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. So who is really doing the work of salvation? Is it us or is it God? For Paul the answer is yes. God is the one who can accomplish it. But God chooses to accomplish it in and through us. Not just to offer it to us on a plate, but to work it through us in our lives. As we try to do what Jesus says, God will make it a reality. So as we go from this place, let's keep trying. Let's keep building on the foundation. Trusting the one who helps us. Amen. Thank you God for red letters. Ground began to shake. 
Trace of God started falling And I became a free man that day The prison walls started falling And I am a free